Right. Thank you, Professor Kwao. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak in this very historic uh, conference. Historic uh, for the reason that we all know uh, what Donogu and Stevenson represent for us as far as the thought of negligence uh, is concerned. Uh, the topic you advertised for me was medical uh, negligence in Ghana in your program. Yeah, so I've just uh, made a little tweak to it. So I will be speaking on medical negligence in Ghana beyond Donogu and Stevenson the need to bid farewell to Bolam uh, tests. Uh, before uh, proceeding, uh, let me say that Donogu and Stevenson, uh, as we know, has been quite uh, monumental. And for that matter, I will briefly uh, underscore how important the Nogu and Stevenson uh, has been. Then I will look at the duty of healthcare professionals and I will pay attention to how to establish a uh, breach of duty of care, uh, especially the Bolam tests, which developed the very same year that we had our independent in 57, and how uh, going by the English uh, medical negligence, which we also have our umbilical cord from, we have been influenced by this particular test in trying to determine whether a healthcare professional is really uh, liable uh, for uh, negligence or not, whether has breached the duty of care. And again, I will be discussing the attempt to abolish Bulam tests by the more recent uh, decision in Montgomery decided in 19, 2015. And I will uh, draw attention to how uh, slavish uh, our courts have been in trying to follow Bulam tests, uh, despite the fact that a lot of uh, challenges have been uh, express as far as that uh, test or that decision is concerned. And I will argue that if you look at uh, some recent statutory trends, if or nothing at all, you look at the Mental Health Act, you look at the Public Health Act. Now, certain uh, patient rights which have been guaranteed or which have been enshrined in those legislation uh, point to a certain direction that uh, Bolam test should no longer uh, be the straight lens uh, through which the court look to determine whether there has been uh, a breach of duty of care or not. And I will ultimately argue in conclusion that it is more helpful the court to to adhere, no, not to adhere strictly to Bolam and rather embrace uh, patients' uh, rights approach, uh, which seems to be the paradigm uh, which our lawmakers in various uh, recent legislation are pointing uh, towards. Uh, so uh, just before uh, we move on, in case you are part of this conference and you are not a lawyer or law student, uh, there's a particular era of thought uh, we call the thought of uh, negligence. And the thought of negligence, uh, as we know, and for which reason we are having the current uh, conference, uh, has had a very interesting uh, history in the sense that before 1932, uh, when uh, Donogu and Stevenson were decided with Lord uh, Atkins' famous uh, 
articulation of the neighbor principle, which law student and for that matter, lawyers know uh, very well. The position of the law uh, used to be that before you could actually hold uh, someone uh, liable for uh, personal injury in tort, for example, it depended very much uh, upon you being able to show uh, physical damage inflicted, uh, inflicted directly on you, in which case you have to uh, prove what you call like the trespass to a person, as it were. Or if it was uh, 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 indirectly, that was the trespass on the case, or action on the case, uh, as uh, it were. But in those situations where the law was repaired to recognize uh, what in the modern parlance we call thought of negligence. As we know, the three elements which Professor Powell and other speakers have uh, really uh, espoused that there must be existence of duty of care, that the duty of care uh, was breached by the conduct or mission of the defendant in question, and that uh, as a result of the breach of duty of care, you, the plaintiff or claimant, have suffered a uh, certain uh, injury. And that injury is as a result of that uh, breach of duty of care. Now, the, the rare difficulty was to show that whether, as a matter of fact, a duty of care existed uh, between you and the alleged tort visa, that is the defendant. There were limited category of situations in which the common law had recognized uh, existence of duty of care, but that was very limited. That is to say that if you had any injury as a result of the act or mission of another person and yours did not fall within any of those uh, categories, and you could also not establish maybe existence of a uh, a contractual relationship and so on, you will go uh, remediless. And it was against that backdrop that uh, Lord Atkins' articulation of the neighbor principle was very welcoming in the sense that uh, all that you needed to establish was to be able to establish the, 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 you know, the proximate relationship, the foreseeability that if you are so uh, related uh, to another person, not relation in terms of geography or blood, but that if you do not have that person in care, I mean, in mind, in how you conduct yourself or you fail to conduct yourself, and the person is going to be affected by you in terms of going to be injured, then the law recognizes the uh, existence of the uh, duty of care. So uh, in the in in Nashe, Donogu and Stevenson, uh, true famous dictum of the law, that King came to remind us that the categories of negligence are never close. That is to say that you cannot actually have an exhaustive statement of instances in which the law will say that someone owed another person a duty of care. And uh, it is very instructive to note that uh, in uh, our own Supreme Court uh, decision, we do NASA against uh, McBroom. Uh, that says uh, Aqua, as uh, he then was, uh, reviewed the evolution of the law of negligence since uh, Donogu and Stevenson and made the point that duty of care depends on the circumstances of uh, each case. And more uh, importantly, it arises from the nature of the relationship uh, between the parties. Now, what this means is that when it comes to medical law, when it comes to the doctor-patient relationship or the healthcare professional uh, or patient uh, uh, relationship, uh, as it were, it is not difficult for us to recognize existence of the uh, duty of care. So for it, we don't need to waste a lot of time and energy to argue whether a healthcare professional owed a patient a duty of care or not, because as we can see, it is very easy for us to establish uh, the 
the, the, the pro proximate relationship to establish uh, the fact that having regard to the nature of the relationship, the, 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 the healthcare professional, the patient, the patient uh, investing, uh, if you like, his whole being, his whole uh, destiny in terms of existence into the care of the healthcare professional for purposes of diagnosis, for purposes of uh, treatment and prognosis and all other uh, things related to the management of the health of the patient. Uh, there's no doubt that the healthcare professional certainly will owe the patient a duty of care to ensure that he carries out uh, his work properly so as not to injure the patient. Yeah, so we are not really going to even be pushed to uh, the subsequent attempt in the Caparo against the Dickman that uh, if you are confronted with a completely new case or what they call it, a novel situation in which uh, duty of care has never been recognized and we needed to find out whether it had been recognized, uh, the court will ask, uh, was the damage caused to the claimant or plaintiff by the defendant reasonably foreseeable? And secondly, was the relationship between the defendant and the claimant or plaintiff reasonably proximate? And thirdly, is it just and reasonable to impose a duty of care on the defendant? So in medical you know, cases uh, situation, we will not very much uh, have to uh, struggle with the caparitis, except that maybe in a few cases, for example, uh, where a hospital, there's a hospital, the facility uh, has not officially been closed down, but let's suppose that there is no uh, healthcare professional available and probably that's the which man or something. And, a patient, for example, is rushed there in an emergency situation, but there's no uh, healthcare professional to attend to that patient, despite the fact that the facility is open. So a uh, question may arise, does the healthcare facility owe a duty of care to such a, a patient? Of course, we have a few uh, authorities from uh, UK and uh, Australia, which suggests that uh, insofar as the healthcare facility uh, has not closed down to the knowledge of the public and they are projecting it as being open for business, then there is an obligation on the part of the management of the facility to ensure that there is a healthcare professional available. Otherwise, if there's nobody available to receive or attend to the patient, it is more likely for the court to recognize that a duty of care uh, existed and the facility ought to have ensured that there'll be a professional available. But apart from this, uh, some of these are limited examples, we do not really have to worry about existence of the duty of care. But the crux of the matter has to do with what you call the, the breach of the duty of care. Uh, the breach of the duty of care and that is where the focus of my uh, reflection uh, really is. Now, as far as the breach of duty of care is concerned, we need to determine the appropriate standard of care because you must have a yardstick and then you use that yardstick to judge the conduct or omission of the particular uh, healthcare uh, professional. Now, it is the, the YASI, the, the evaluative framework, uh, the standard of care, uh, which has been uh, problematic. And uh, for Ghana, as we know very well, uh, our law for obvious historical reason is largely uh, influenced by the direction of uh, English law. And when it comes to medical law, it is no different. That's why the fact that if you go to the other side of the Atlantic, you go to the North America, the US and the Canada, uh, as far as medical negligence is concerned, you notice that the law over there has developed uh, differently. 
And those of you who follow the jurisprudence or the case law from there, you also appreciate that the hefty or very heavy uh, damages or compensation are often uh, awarded for obvious reason. And uh, doctors or healthcare professionals are obligated over there to make uh, full disclosures and all that to patients and so on and so forth. So the story there is different. But coming back to English uh, medical law, where uh, Ghanaian uh, medical negligence draws inspiration from, uh, in 1957, a very uh, interesting case, which was even like a, a decision of a, a court of affairs uh, instance, uh, propounded a test uh, which has become known as the, the Bolam uh, test. Uh, and essentially to the effect that where you bring a case against a healthcare professional as uh, his or her conduct, uh, having resulted in injury that you are complaining about, uh, the court must not necessarily do uh, what is done in general negligence cases, where normal uh, negligence cases we just use what they call like the reasonable man test, right? But in Bolam, the court made the point that the plaintiff needed to establish that the doctor did not act as a reasonable doctor. And not acting as a reasonable doctor not necessarily means that did not act as a normal reasonable man, as we know in general uh, tort cases. The flip side was that if the defendant doctor could, for example, assemble other doctors or healthcare professionals to come and testify under oath that they too will have conducted themselves in the same way as the, this particular defendant, healthcare professional or doctor behave, then the court cannot conclude that there was a breach of duty of care by this defendant doctor. Now this uh, has been problematic for uh, many years because unlike other type of uh, sort of negligence uh, uh, cases uh, where the court will need to do its own proper evaluation of the evidence to come to a conclusion using, if you like, an imaginary concept of a, a reasonable uh, man, what we say, the man on the Clapham uh, bus or the man on the KGTR trotro or the Makula trotro, uh, here, the court is more or less relegating its judicial uh, obligation to evaluate the evidence and make its own assessment and rather just defer to the, the healthcare professionals. So therefore, the doctor is able to get a certain number of uh, doctors to come and testify in competition to what the plaintiff will also be able to assemble from other doctors. So long as uh, the patient is able to get what we call a reasonable body of uh, medical opinion supporting what he did, he'll be able to get away with the allegation of uh, uh, negligence uh, against him. And uh, this uh, Bolam test was not uh, limited to only where there has been actual instances of a physical injury, but even with respect to disclosure of information. In other words, if a patient underwent uh, treatment and the patient was not told information regarding the treatment and later on a certain uh, negative uh, outcome occurs and the patient decides to sue the healthcare uh, you know, professional. Now the court, among other things, will need to decide if whether the patient will be given the information which was not uh, given. So that the patient may be saying that, well, if I be given the information, I will not have probably consented to undergo uh, such uh, treatments. And because I was not given that information, that is why I find myself in this situation. So by not giving me the information, you breach the duty of care. That is what the patient will be saying. But the court will, uh, following the Bolam test, find out, uh, will other doctors, a reasonable body of medical uh, opinion, would they have considered it necessary to disclose such information to the patient? 
If the answer is no, then the doctor or the healthcare professional cannot be found liable for having failed to disclose information to the patient before he or she consented to the particular uh, procedure and so on. Obviously, uh, this way of handling uh, these type of uh, negligence cases, whether it be natural injury or disclosure information uh, has been quite problematic. And for that matter, uh, the courts realizing how unsatisfactory the Bolan test has been, made a bit of concession in the Bolaito case uh, in 1997 that now we are not going to simply fold our hands and say that uh, because the defendant uh, doctor or the defendant uh, healthcare professional has been able to bring a reasonable body of uh, healthcare professional to come and confirm what he did. We are just going to accept that and say that the defendant cannot be held liable for negligence. No. Now the court said that now we are going to subject the, 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 the other medical opinion, that is the other healthcare professionals uh, that have been produced by the defendant doctor to try and persuade the court that uh, what the defendant doctor did, for example, is not different from what they too have done. The court is not just going to accept that. The court in Bolito said that we are going to also question the logical basis of such opinion. In other words, the court will have to scrutinize uh, whether the premises, the basis, uh, which the medical opinion, for example, uh, is funded, whether it is logical. So that if the court found Ill illogicality in what the other doctors or healthcare professionals say they have done, then the court is not going to just accept that other uh, healthcare professionals or other doctors are saying that if they were confronted with the situation which this defendant doctor uh, uh, had, they will have behaved in the same way. Yeah, so that was a very uh, 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 healthy development, meaning that now the court is gradually uh, coming home, trying to tone down its uh, differential pusher to healthcare uh, professionals. But the good thing uh, is that the Bolam test, which had actually pervaded a lot of medical negligence cases since 1957, uh, suffered what we may call at the cool degrees uh, not too long ago uh, in 2015 in the case uh, known as uh, Montgomery against uh, uh, Lake Nashe. And that case is also a case from uh, Scotland, just as the Bolam II was the case from Scotland. But very interestingly, we had like the, uh, we had a pregnant uh, woman uh, who uh, had to deliver and uh, she was not uh, told that having regard to her history and all that, uh, if she had a normal vagina delivery, there was a, a great risk of uh, some uh, deformity happening to the baby because of a delay in the delivery and all that. So uh, that was not done. And during the, the, the vagina delivery, there was a, a delay the shoulder of the of the baby uh, you know, got a lock up somewhere. And as a result of that, there was a, a cerebral a, a, a palsy, which the, the baby actually uh, suffered. And for that matter, the mother, Mrs. Montgomery, uh, came to court and uh, her argument uh, was that if she had been told that 
there was uh, that risk that if the delivery uh, had been uh, vagina delivery, there will have been that dystosia or that unfortunate uh, incident which uh, happened to her and for that matter, the baby, she will not have uh, opted for vagina delivery and she will have gone for cesarean session as an alternative. And a uh, question which arose in this type of uh, negligence case was whether the failure by the doctor to actually share information with the pregnant woman regarding the, the risk, right? Nine to 10% risk uh, of uh, dystocia in a diabetic woman, uh, whether that constituted uh, a breach of duty of care. Now, the defendant sought to uh, take advantage of Golan test, but the court said that uh, no, uh, it is not a question of whether other healthcare professionals who have not considered it necessary uh, to share uh, such information or they have considered it necessary to share such information. Now, what is important is that having regard to the patient, can we say that a reasonable person in the patient's position who have attached significance, who have attached importance to uh, such a risk. If the answer is yes, then the healthcare professional uh, will have had to make such a disclosure and the failure to make such a disclosure will be treated as a breach of duty of care. So here, what is uh, very interesting is that we see the court trying to uh, put the patient first rather than the opinion of uh, the medical people or the healthcare professionals. And that is uh, very uh, welcoming. And of course, uh, those who are familiar with the very old case of the Cedar Way, you notice that uh, a dissenting opinion by one of the respected uh, judges of the uh, English uh, court in recent time, Los Kaman, uh, as far back as the uh, early 80s, was pointing to this particular point that in trying to make a determination as whether uh, there has been a breach of duty of care in relation to disclosure of information prior to concern by the patient, it is not the opinion of the healthcare professionals which matters, but rather it is the position of a, a reasonable person in the shoes of the patient. So that is a very uh, uh, welcoming as I have uh, indicated. Now, if you come back to our own uh, backyard, if you look at uh, the few cases, and before I talk about uh, what the trend uh, has been in our own backyard, let me uh, make the point that there is often the talk as whether medical negligence in Ghana, whether it does not exist or it exists. Why do we say that? Because uh, if you look at the law reports, right? If you look at the law report, you notice that we don't see any significant number of uh, medical negligence cases. So is it enough for us to say that because we don't see a significant number of medical negligence cases, it is not really uh, a problem. They don't exist. No, uh, they exist. And in fact, if you were to spend time to just, just review, if you like, the few uh, cases which people even complain about in the media, you notice that if people were to actually litigate uh, medical negligence cases, it will be one of the uh, leading uh, 
uh, cases which are usually uh, reported in the law uh, report. But of course, you know, in our country, there's what we call like the farmer in army syndrome. Um, for that matter, uh, people uh, will not rather want to challenge uh, mistakes and also accidents by uh, healthcare professionals. And that, that explains uh, why, uh, if you look at the law reports, you will get shocked as you Ghana, as whether Ghana does not have a problem with the medical uh, negligence uh, cases. Uh, that notwithstanding, uh, one will notice that if you look at the few cases, for example, Asante Kremu against the uh, Attorney General, uh, one of the uh, well known uh, cases as far as the medical uh, negligence is concerned, you will notice that there was the court applied uh, BOLAM. The court applied BOLAM, and the BOLAM was applied uh, without any uh, difficulty at all. That is to say that the, uh, the court considered this uh, as if like the BOLAM was, if you like, the, the, the gold standard in trying to uh, determine whether there has been uh, uh, medical uh, negligence or not. The same thing apply in the Jan against the uh, Ashanti. But uh, if you look at the more recent uh, decision uh, by uh, uh, Pepu Akabwafo in the case involving uh, 37 military hospital, uh, which, which, which has the title Chimbua and Namicha against uh, Attorney General. And you know the facts are very similar to the English decision in the Montgomery against the like, Nashe that we have seen. Now that also uh, involved uh, a pregnant uh, woman who also uh, was not allowed to choose. I mean, she indicated that uh, she would have uh, wanted to have delivery by cesarean session, but the team which attended to her ignored that and rather induced her to have a vagina delivery. And in the course of uh, that, complications developed and the mother died, uh, leaving only the child the child also uh, suffered uh, some deformities. So therefore, the, the husband or the father uh, sued the, the hospital. And if you look at the title of the case, it will not strike you that it is a, a, a case involving hospital because the defendant is attorney general. And the same thing, if you look at the Sandin Kamo, I know the, the defendant is attorney general. The reason being that the hospitals involved are public hospitals. And we know that for public hospitals or government hospitals, uh, if you look at our constitution, the attorney general is the nominal uh, defendant uh, as it were. And for that matter, we direct the case against the attorney general. That is why uh, it appears uh, that way. But what is uh, relevant uh, to us this afternoon, as far as the Chimbua against Attorney General is concerned, is how uh, Bolam was actually applied. And I have just uh, taken uh, uh, two lines from the opinion or the judgment of uh, Justice uh, Akabuafo, and, and I quote, in a somewhat more recent case, Dr. Sandis Abrahamata against General Medical Council, uh, for JA, in his concurring judgment, stated the law that, quote, I will agree with the appellant when he contended that in diagnosis and treatment, there are differences of opinion between medical officers. A medical officer is not negligent merely because his conclusion differed from the professional or because he displayed less skill or knowledge than the other. Then he'll go on. As stated in the case of Hunter and Hanley and the White House in Jordan, 
cited by that plan. The true test in establishing negligence in diagnosis or treatment on the part of a doctor is whether he has been proved to be guilty of such failure as no doctor of ordinary skill will be guilty of acting with ordinary care. Fair and reasonable standard of care and competence are required. The facts of each case should be the sole determinant whether a medical man should be found negligent for wrong di diagnosis or not, unquote. Now, if you look at the portion of the judgment of uh, of which uh, I have quoted, uh, you notice that implicitly he uh, endorsed, of course, he had no choice because the uh, Sandy uh, Abraham case is a, a decision by the Court of Appeal against the Medical and Dental Council. So the High Court is bound by statement of the law by the Appellate Court and so on. So he had very uh, little say in the matter. So if you look at the Sandy's case, which implicitly is uh, uh, followed uh, by the Chimboa uh, case, you know, the court was just following the Bolam. What does Bolam say? Bolam is saying that, yes, there can be differences of uh, opinion. And for that matter, if the plaintiff is complaining that uh, what happened on the occasion in question resulting in the injury or the damage that he or she has suffered was because of a failure of care by the defendant, uh, doctor, or healthcare professional, that is not enough. If the defendant, healthcare professional or doctor could also get other people to confirm that for that type of situation, it could have also be handled in an alternative way. Then, uh, according to Bolam, that should be the end of the matter. And that uh, is what is implicit in uh, Sandy uh, Abraham Atta's case, uh, which was uh, more or less uh, 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 followed. Uh, in principle, by the Chimboa case. Now, what okay. is worrying is that Dr. Uh, Dr. and the Dr. Dr. case is more recent, just a 2012, right? But if you take the fact that uh, Bulaito, right? Bulaito in 1997 uh, started questioning uh, strict adherence to the Bolam test, and uh, Sandy Abraham, which came later on. Uh, seem uh, not to be very much aware of difficulties with the Bolam. And for that matter, the uh, concession in Bolaito that the court should rather be cautious in just uh, accepting uh, the, the, the experts in you know, account by the defendant's uh, witness and rather uh, question the logical basis of whatever they say before the court can also uh, embrace what the defendant uh, experts are saying. Now that seems to have been lost on our court and that is the problem that I'm trying to establish uh, in this uh, reflection. Now, if you look at new legislations, which uh, we have adopted not too long ago, there is a certain trend and that trend implicitly or indirectly is trying to say uh, goodbye to Bolam test. Why do we say that? Now, we notice that Bolam test developed in a context which did not recognize informed consent. And that was why in the Sidawa case, uh, the majority of the, the House of Laws even rejected suggestion by the minority opinion was common uh, concerning uh, any attempt to recognize uh, an informed consent. So the point I make is that insofar as we are now getting direct statutory articulation of uh, patient right in a more vivid uh, way, including uh, informed consent, the fact that you must actually explain the implications of a proposed procedure and then the alternative to that proposed uh, procedure and all that to the patient uh, actually re 
enforces the point that it is not just enough when something has gone wrong for the healthcare professional to, for example, get other reasonable body of medical opinion to say that what this professional did is not anything strange. Some other healthcare professionals who have also behaved in that same way. I mean, the, the, the rights-based uh, approach, uh, which is reflected in the Mental Health Act of uh, 2012, as well as the Public Health Act, uh, actually uh, question uh, strict adherence to uh, Bolam tests in trying to determine the appropriateness or otherwise of how a medical professional acted in a particular situation. And it is very poignant to remember that if you look at Section 167 of the Healthcare of the Public Health Act, actually a statutory uh, enactment of uh, what we call the patient's uh, charter, a whole compendium of the rights of patients and all that, that give a certain complexion to how medical negligence uh, cases should be presented uh, in our jurisdiction. And it's not just a, a matter of uh, going by the mundane uh, common law uh, approach, and especially when it comes to like, the standard of care, uh, just settle with the BOLAM test, as I have indicated. I think more is uh, expected in our jurisdiction, and here, the emphasis I would like to think is more on the patient-centered approach. So we try to uh, determine the appropriateness or otherwise of the healthcare professional's action or omission by uh, working out from what will be considered significant by a reasonable patient. So it's not the healthcare professional's opinion uh, as reflected in BOLA, which is the way to go, rather, it is a perspective of the reasonable uh, patient or the reasonable person in the shoe of that particular uh, patient. So, uh, Prof. Chair, uh, those are my uh, tentative uh, conclusions, and I'll take uh, comments and questions. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ozudapa, for. Uh, that insightful presentation. Um, if you can exit your um, your, your uh, share now, okay. So now the floor is open for 